<laughs> okay, so I just got the comment of I should give extra credit for people who come for some sort of class participation point. But actually, oh man, <laughs> oh, okay. um, but actually, you guys get access to the stuff the teacher and random extra credit that the people who don't come never get because they, but by the time they listen to the lecture, usually it's over, right? Because um, I usually don't post it the next day. So I'm just saying, you guys kind of do have a, get a little something special. Which reminds me, the topo isomerase thing. I got a whole bunch of things. I need to go through it, but there were some good ones. I'll report back on that on Tuesday. Ah, uh, the Tuesday after break. Okay. Uh, business. Exam two, I keep getting people asking me what it is. It's for, it's, it's going to be on April Fool's Day. It actually probably should be earlier than that. I should make it the Thursday before because I was just going through things, but I'm just going to leave it on this date. And if anything, we'll have some review time. Um, so it's not the third. Tell that to all the people who are not here because the people who ask me in recitation um, are usually people who are not here in class. Um, there's no quiz this weekend because this weekend is spring break. Um, there is a quiz though that following weekend. That's a quiz that people tend to forget about because you're all like spring break, and then you're like, oh no. <laughs> so just like make a note to yourself that you need to uh, make sure you take that quiz. So this keeps getting longer and longer. Uh, last time, what did we do last time? So I'm not going to go through everything, but last time we finished our list of proteins important for S phase. Right, so we had helicase, single strand binding proteins, topoisomerases, sliding clamp, clamp loader, and then we spoke at length about initiation of DNA replication in bacteria versus eukarya itself. And at that point, your eyes looked glazed over. And we stopped. Um, and so we ended with this um, task, right? Compare and contrast regulation of initiation of DNA replication in bacteria versus eukaryotic cells. So now that you've had a nice amount of time to think about it, because I know you've been thinking since then, all the way through, nothing but. Um, do you guys want to start by like? talking to each other and just kind of reminding yourselves, now that you have fresh brains, hopefully. Um, no, no one has a fresh brain by 3.30. Um, so think about initiation of DNA replication in bacteria versus eukaryotic cells. We're talking about regulation, okay? So what regulates whether there will, whether DNA replication will initiate? Do you want to talk to friends, or do you want to discuss as a class? Discuss as a class. Okay. Discuss as a class. Okay. So let's talk first about bacteria. Right? So in bacteria, what regulates whether or not DNA replication will initiate? Right. So the methylation status of the origin. Right. So what form is competent for... Initiation? Fully mm -hmm. methylated, right? So that's fairly simple. Um, and so what about in eukaryotic cells? Yep. Binding of recognition protein. Okay, so um, ORC. Okay, so that's one thing that needs to happen. And what did you have? Uh, well, definitely origins tend to be um, um, more acetylated than methylated, but um, think more about what needs to happen in order for it to actually start, start replication. Yeah? What about, um, I think it was a uh, helicase binding to CDP1. Right, so, so we have a few things, right, so the origin recognition complex, and then your helicase loading proteins and helicase need to come and bind. Yep. The clamp loader and the clamp? 
Um, the clamp loader and the clamp, that is not yet, but that does have to happen at some point. But we want to think to ourselves, what's going to actually, so we're setting up our pre-replicative complex with ORC, PVT1, PVC6, and the kilo cake, right? So that all has to be there. But what's going to initiate it? Right, so STDK, that kinase that is only active when S cyclins are present, right? That kinase needs to phosphorylate things. So you've got your pre-replicative -repli complex kind of sitting there and set up, but initiation truly happens when STDK comes and is active. Because then it needs to phosphorylate your ORC, it needs to phosphorylate your CD6, which then will be degraded. It needs to phosphorylate your um, other replication machinery and trigger uh, actual firing of the organ. Yeah. So if SCDK doesn't regulate initiation in bacteria, what does set some transcription factor that causes that? Well, so, okay. So the question is, if there's no SCDK regulating initiation in bacteria, what does? And so we spoke about methylation, right? Um, so it really has to do with the methyl transferases, the DNA methyl transferases uh, that do the methylating. So when they're at high enough levels and are active enough, to catch up and methylate that newer strand of DNA, then you'll get that fully methylated organ. So it's a much simpler system. Did I see a hand up over here somewhere? <coughs> yes. So during, for bacteria during one round of replication, um, it becomes half, half, a half methylated, right? And then it fits. Um, okay, so during, in bacteria, during replication, what happens is your parent strand is methylated, right, because it was methylated. Your new strand of DNA is not methylated because it's new, right? And then there's a lag time between completion of replication and full methylation. And so that is that refractory period where you cannot, that origin cannot fire again until it becomes completely methylated. Okay. Yes? Is CDT1 phosphorylated by the F, uh, CDT? Yeah, CDT1 is phosphorylated by FCDK. Yeah. yeah. And then it's recognized by FCF and degraded. Any other questions? Yeah. Sorry. So what's methylated? Is it the origin that's methylated? The origin. In bacteria, the origin is methylated. I mean, it's not like that's the only thing that's methylated. Bacterial DNA is highly methylated. But in terms of origin availability, it's that fully methylated status that's required. Any other questions? Okay, sometimes comparing and contrasting is a really nice way to think about things. Um, in a different way than just, you know, reading your notes. Okay. Good. Okay, so initiation is followed by priming and synthesis. Um, and this is what we drew. This is what you know, right? Leading and lagging strand synthesis is coupled at the replication point. So you're going to get recruitment of your... Clamp, and this is it goes back to what you were saying, clamp, clamp loader, polymerase. Remember, we talked about your clamp loader binding to the primer template junction and then recruiting the clamp, and then that recruits polymerase. So now it's time to start fitting all these pieces together. Okay, so, oh, I had a movie. Um, so for those of you who did not like drawing, there is a movie, which you may or may not have seen. Now, I apologize for the poor volume that we're going to have. Let me see something here. At one point, I saw that. 
Let's see if that works. Look at that. What if I just stand here like this and talk to you? <gasps> yes! I love the music. I love how this, the, it's from the textbook publishers. They always have like the coolest music. It's like, does anyone listen to Echoes ever? No, forget it. Forget it. Okay. You guys can watch that again and again if you want. So hopefully it all makes sense. Yeah. No, I'm not saying I hope. Okay. Okay, good. Oh, you know what? They put the short primer. Was that where the Okizaki fragments were released? The primer, so remember, the primer, let me just go back to here. Here's just showing the same thing, right? Here's the blue. Those primers, those are the, it's on the Latin strand. Each Okazaki fragment begins at the primer and ends at the next primer. Right? So from basically here to here. Is one of his Aki fragment. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Does anything refer to SSB to the um to the Latin strand? Um, so what regulates recruitment of single strand binding protein? So actually it's funny that you ask because I was trying to find a, a paper, like a new exciting paper that we could talk about in class that would give us some practice with kind of thinking problems and there's a new paper that just came out talking about single strand binding proteins um, and how they're involved in um, stall replication forks and stuff like that and DNA damage response. But anyways, they're talking about how there's um, a huge pool of, you can imagine like this prior to DNA replication you're going to have increased expression of, of single-strand binding proteins. It's going to be a huge pool of it in the nucleus. And they, like, they bind very strongly to single-strand DNA. So since there's a lot of it there, and there's a lot of single-strand DNA with all these origins, they're going to bind, right? And so this paper was talking about how actually depletion of that pool causes um, DNA replication catastrophe but that's a different story. We won't even go there right now. But yeah, so it's not so much that some protein needs to recruit it, it's more of that. And now mind you, I could be wrong, but my understanding is that it's just a high, high amount of it. Um, it's there, it's kind of like the binding protein is there and the substrate kind of thing is there and we're good. Any other questions? Uh, if this was like a bubble, that the lagging part of DNA, like the old DNA strand, 
could be wrapped around and you can move to the left, right? Um, so here's your parental DNA, right? Yeah. Um, and so you want to know where the other side is. So yes, yeah, so this would wrap around this way and come over here. Okay, and so your other fork is on, it would be on this side. Okay, did I draw that? I feel like I drew that the other day. Yeah. I still have one on my phone. <laughs> yeah. If you want, can you email me that picture and I'll post it? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'll post, because we did work it out in recitation, and I believe we spoke about it a, a little bit in, um, in lecture. But I'll post the picture of how the whole thing would work. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So we spoke about initiation. We spoke about um, the synthesis. So now we have to talk about termination, right? And termination is fairly simple, right? With bacteria, remember circular chromosome, you get replication. And when they run, when both forks run into each other, that's termination, <coughs> right? So this is when the two replication forks meet at the opposite ends and origin, if they terminate. Um, and so in bacteria and viruses, anything with a circular genome, replication results in linked chromosomes. It's also called catenation, and that needs to be resolved. And that's called decatenation. And that resolution is done by the activity of topoisomerase. Um, so again, you know, you learned about topoisomerase already. So someone had asked the other day about topoisomerase in bacteria. And there is topoisomerase in bacteria, and it's very much involved with this decatenation. Okay? So also, though, in eukaryotic cells, remember you've got all these origins. They're all firing in clusters. You've got this bidirectional replication fork movement. And that is going to result in, um, it's going to result in intertwined daughter molecules of DNA. And so those also will be resolved by topoisomerase. And so remember, we talked about two types of topoisomerase one that cuts one strand and one that cuts both and passes one through. Here you're going to see a lot of activity of the one that's going to cut both and pass a strand, that strand passage um, to boisomerase. Um, so, right, because so, so in eukaryotic cells, termination does not occur at one site, right? Why? Right, so you've got multiple origins. So every time a bubble runs in, a bubble broadens and forks run into each other, you're going to get termination. So it's terminating multiple sites, exactly. Okay, so that's that. So then we've got our ends of our chromosomes to worry about, right? So we've replicated everything, and then we're done, but we've got our ends. So this brings us back to the end replication problem, which I had um, brought up earlier in the semester. Right? This is when you've got um, you've got your leading strand and your lagging strand, right? And then you're going to have removal of that that um, five prime primer, and then there's no there's no like there's nothing to fix it, right? Because you need a three prime OH to synthesize DNA with DNA polymerase, right? And so you'll end up with this fragment missing. And over many rounds of DNA replication, that will result in that progressive shortening of the chromosome. So that's your end replication problem that we spoke about earlier. Is this a problem in bacteria? No, right, because there's no end, right? OK. Any questions about this? Yes. So Eukaryotes, the number of telomeres tells it or usually tells the age of a cell. Yes, the number telomere of repeats, yeah. So how do bacteria know when to stop replicating? Okay, so so the question is, in eukaryotic cells, the number of telomere repeats 
um, basically is like a molecular ruler, right? And it controls the number of replication, re number of times a cell can replicate or before senescence, right? Okay. In bacteria, how do you know how many times you can replicate? Um, well, let's think about that. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Raise your hand if you have to hear someone. Can you repeat the question? In eukaryotic cells, the number of telomere, re telomere repeats tells you something about the age of the cell and about how many times it can replicate. It can only replicate until you run out of telomere repeats, pretty much, right? And then you will have senescence. <coughs> Unless you have the activity of telomerase, that's going to keep it going. Right? So, um, but in bacteria, there are no telomeres. So what regulates the, num the amount of times the bacteria can replicate? Anything? Do you need to regulate them? Yeah, so bacteria are more, more regulate their growth based on nutrients. Right, so it's not like, it's not like, back, so ba bacteria are such a simple organism, and so they're just like, replicate, replicate, right? Um, I don't think anything stops them from growing other than drugs, <laughs> antibiotics, um, starvation, so if they have enough nutrients, they won't replicate as often. Um, I don't know that, that there's, I guess a bacteria that's going to minimize its replication um, isn't going to be as, no, we take that back. Now, so then, let's think about this in another way, because I just had, I'm going to take you in a second, I just had another thought of how we can interpret your question differently. What about how different bacteria, and this is where we need to get some other people in this room, Different bacteria have different um, growth cycles, right? Like a mycobacterium tuberculosis only replicates every however many days, which is like very infrequently, whereas E. coli is every 20 minutes. And what regulates that? And is there any anything, any relationship to your question? Yeah? Wouldn't it be more so like the carrying capacity of the environment? Exactly, carrying capacity of the environment. So right, nutrient, nutrient levels, right? So so nutrient levels are going to determine whether you can replicate because you'll either have the sufficient proteins, enzymes, whatever are required for replication or you won't. Yeah, so what I'm referring to is so if you're saying in a properly nutrient environment, uh, this one organism can replicate that. Yeah. Of the uh, um, I don't know, but I didn't say anything about mutation. I said nothing about mutation. No. So in so in a proper environment, so let's say a bacterial culture, where you're constantly adding more media, okay, fresh media constantly. So or you're like constantly getting rid of waste, because uh, really that's really your carrying capacity is determined. Your bacteria will replicate forever. I believe so. Um, I don't know what else is going to stop it. Mutation, mutations can arise all the time. But remember, if you have a mutation, that one's just going to die. Because your bacteria are individuals. Living in a community, but individuals, whereas cells, um, at least mammalian cells are, are tissues in an organism where, where, it's going to have a different effect when you have mutation. How are, how are people liking this? Does anyone have any thoughts? Does anyone disagree? Does anyone think that there's something else that should stop bacteria from replicating? Because I'm, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Okay. It's interesting. Okay. 
Okay, so here's another way to look at the n replication problem. Right, so this is the picture I showed you of replication, right, where it's this one unit moving forwards. And eventually you're going to get to this point where you can't lay down another primer to, um, or you can't lay down a primer like over here. So you can extend to this, and that's why you have this n replication problem, right? And so that's what results in this. Okay, so as you already know, it's cell by telomerase, right? So this is DNA synthesis using an RNA template. And so the telomerase enzyme itself um, uses, the, tel the telomerase enzyme itself carries its own template. And so you can imagine, it also kind of looks like a hand, a little bit. So this will be your thumb. Your palm is still your active site, like DNA polymerase. Um, and then you've got your fingers. And then bound on the inside of your palm, close to the active site, is your RNA template. And so this is what it would do, right? So you would have your parental strand, and then here's your end replication problem, this gap here. And what telomerase is going to do is it's going to bind, and remember, it's got its own template, this RNA template, and it's going to base pair <coughs> at the end, and it's going to extend. And so it extends the leading strand. It actually doesn't do anything to that lagging strand. It extends to the leading strand. And then the different DNA polymerase, I believe alpha, comes in and fills it in. Yeah? When you say leading strand, we can also say parental strand. Um, or are you going to do that? Um, well, this is back what it's showing here. Um, I think of it as a leading lagging strand thing because the end replication problem is an issue of the lagging strand, right? Because only the lagging strand has that final primer causing trouble, right? So, um, but yeah, so then you get filled in. So, as long as you have telomerase activity, you're going to keep extending your leading strand, and then you can keep filling in your lagging strand, and you won't get progressively shorter. So, how many times can telomerase do this? It depends on the cell type. Right? Telomerase is going to have different activities or different expression levels in different cell types. So, and that's why cancer cells tend to have dysregulated, overexpressed telomerase, and they <laughs> keep those telomeres long so that that cell can keep replicating. So, what the term, like, what the term is? So you want to know what regulates telomerase. See, I like the way Dennis thinks because he always is thinking what's regulating. I said it's true because that's, that's how you have to think about this. And so my guess is telomerase, I, I don't know, and so maybe we can make this an extra credit. Two in a row. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head, but I would guess I will reason through it and then you can let me know if I'm right or wrong for extra credit. How's that sound? So that question is, um, what regulates the activity of telomerase? Or what, what regulates telomerase? Why do you have cells with high telomerase activity? Why do you have cells with low telomerase activity? I'm going to reason through it. And then if I'm right, I get the extra credit. <laughs> and if you're right, if I'm wrong, then you get the extra credit. No, you get the extra credit if you're right. Um, so my theory is it's expression of telomerase. So telomerase itself is probably tightly regulated in terms of <coughs> its expression. And it's probably only going to be expressed high in cells where it should be expressed high. And in other cells, it's going to be expressed low. And if it's not there, it won't work. But I don't, 
I don't know. So you guys can let me know how I did. Every day is like my orals up here. Yeah. yeah. You sure? Could you prevent like aging by extending the life telomerase? That's what. So that's why people. What if I have any telomerase? type questions, everyone starts emailing me things from these anti-aging websites. Um, so yes, people, so you're saying if you have higher tolerance activity, can you prevent aging? Um, I guess so, but do you really want to mess with telomerase activity? It seems like it's a dangerous thing to do because you really want to regulate how frequently you're troubled to buy, right? When you're into, like, and do you want to live forever? Well, let's talk philosophically for a minute. Who wants to live forever? Yeah? I find that to be so depressing. <laughs> yeah. Um, on that topic, I know they have, they found things going on in the world who never knew. They stayed babies, but never grew. And it was related to the long brain activity. Like their levels is so low that the cells take so long to divide. That they just stayed there. So there are people who ha who never grew, mm -hmm. and it and it was and they found it was directly related. They to are still they're still researching. Yeah, it, that's interesting. Just that's interesting. I have to look that up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's two things here. So the question was, isn't telomerase regulated by the number of telomerase, telomere repeats? Now that's circular thinking in a way, right? Because the telomere repeats are generated by telomerase. Right, but it only has a, number, a certain number, and it still gets shorter and shorter. You still add some, but it's less and less and less, and it gets closer to... So are you saying telomerase activity decreases over time? Yes. Okay. Who's, talking, who's, who's in agreement? Did I just hear another yes? No. That's interesting. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what people find. Talking about like cutting that telomerase in half. You mean the telomere? No. Yeah, telomere. Like cutting that protein in half over the course of time. So you're saying, so here's your telomere repeats, right? This G, 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 C. So I'm talking about protein. Like, if you just chop that protein in half, so it will still be 3 to 5 N, but instead of placing like 10 repeats, it will place. So you're saying like, cut the template in half? Yeah, like cut that. Oh, template. I don't think that's true. But I don't know. So, so many great theories in this first. Let's see what we find. Okay, so let's keep talking about telomerase, right? Okay, so here's some thoughts, and we can talk about this. Um, so here's a thought. What does the structure of telomerase look like? We just spoke about it, right? What does, it what does it look like? Yeah, and so this is where, and so, and DNA polymerase, right? A hand like DNA polymerase. And so you always have to remember that structure and function are related. So when a protein has a certain structure and another protein has the same structure, you can usually guess they might have a similar function. In this case, in this case, it's synthesizing DNA from a different template, but still synthesizing DNA. So why can it only synthesize telomere repeats? Why can it only synthesize this one sequence? Yep. It only has the one. I'm not primer. Don't confuse primer with template, but what you meant to say was template. Okay. That's what you meant to say. Right. It only has that one, that one template bound to it. So I'm glad you said primer because on the exam, I always have people confusing primer and template. And so your, your mistake was a common one, and I'm going to take a minute to differentiate for you, right? Let me just turn this on.
Right, so. Ugh. A primer means it has a three prime OH that you can add things to. So you're going to add bases. Right? A template. So in PCR, that's what your PCR primers are, actually. Your DNA, your polymerase in your PCR is binding to your primer and extending it, right? Template means it's what is being copied, right? So in this case, you know, you've got this A, A, C. So if that's your template, that means that what's going to be synthesized is going to be the complement. Right, just like in DNA replication, your template is your parental strand of DNA, and then your DNA polymerase comes in and synthesizes your daughter strand of DNA, which is the complement. Right. <coughs> so those are two, two two very different things. One is extended, the other is copied, essentially. Right, that would be base pairing. So I just want you guys to keep it straight because last, I think it was last year, I'd say 90% of the class got a question wrong on the exam because they kept talking about telomerase specifically carrying its own primer. It's not a primer, it doesn't carry, I'm just saying it 50 times here so that you guys don't lose those points. Not primer, template, okay? Does everyone understand the difference? I'm glad, I'm so glad you misspoke because I would have forgotten to say something about that. Okay. So right, so the only re the reason it only synthesizes repeats is because it's synthesizing its, whatever it's based on, its template that it's carrying. Exactly. Um, so with human, telomerase be able to elongate mouse telomeres. So I hear no. Who says no? Why? It's species specific, but why? It's built in. Like each species has a different telomere and like you said with the telomerase, it's already the template. Okay, right, so exactly. So each species has its own repeat, it has its own its own telomerate, it has its own template, and it won't match. So what do you mean by match? Who wants to expand on this? I saw a hand up right there. Right, exactly. So here you can see when it's when it comes along, it actually base pairs with the end of the repeat. And so mouse now, I'm just guessing mass telomerase is different. Maybe it's the same. There's a lot of homology there, but maybe it's totally different. It's not going to be as pair, so telomerase is never going to recognize the ends. Exactly. Okay, so telomerase is a reverse transcriptase. What is a reverse transcriptase? Yep. It's an enzyme that reverse transcribes DNA RNA. Right. An enzyme that reverse transcribes RNA to DNA. I had to double check it in my head before I said it. Yep, exactly. Okay. Are you likely to accumulate mutations in your telomeres? And why? Yep. No. No. Well, 
Wait, I think you're going in the wrong direction. Are you likely to accumulate mutations in your telomere? So in your telomere okay, radius. So if the, if the, if the um, telomerase has a mutation in it, it would, have, it would put the wrong telomere sequence on. In, so you're saying if the template gets in the messed up, then the okay. telomeres would get messed up, and that's not likely to happen because if telomerase gets messed up, it probably won't bind correctly to the DNA and make Okay, so the, the argument that I just heard, and I'll get you on you, um, the, the argument that I just heard is no, because the RNA template is would have to get messed up in order to add the wrong base, um, and likely if that got messed up, it wouldn't bind to begin with. Sure. Is that you? Uh, yes. I'm saying no, because the telomeres, uh, the sequence is irrelevant. Okay, so I got a vote for now. Yep. I think yes. Maybe no mutation in the telomeres, but in the telomere themselves. I'm thinking, and then when the telomeres try to add, it can. So maybe that's why some people have premature aging. So you're saying you think maybe yes, but where would it be coming from? Like all stuff around us. <laughs> So you're thinking so that maybe some kind of like chemical yeah, or UV like light. Or light okay. Okay. So that brings in a whole other thing. Okay, we're coming. We're coming. There is a whole other thing. So what I was hearing first is really about direct DNA replication type mutations where a base is incorrectly added or something like that. And now what I'm hearing is well, what if there's some kind of environmental insult? Such as from UV light or from um, chemicals. And maybe that's not going to add on the telomeres, which adds a base there, but on the telomeres, like the ones that get. Right. So it wouldn't. So it would be a mutation that could arise not from the activity of telomerase, but just by yeah. that not being protected. Maybe. Okay. Who else? Yeah. I was saying that maybe um, we could have mutations because instead of using like a DNA template. Using an RNA template, which is probably more prone to mutations than a DNA template. So you're saying you think that the RNA template in telomerase is more prone to mutations than the DNA template that you might use in replicating your DNA. Why? Because you don't have the what is it, the polymerase that comes and does like Oh, uh, so you don't have exonuclease activity. So if a base is incorrectly added, there's no exonuclease activity. Oh, interesting. What do you think to think about? I see, I'm getting a lot of really great ideas. My first thought was actually more Mackenzie, right? More like what Mackenzie was, like that was where my brain was. But everything I'm hearing here actually all sounds logical. Anyone else? I see more people. Interesting. No extra nucleus activity. Yeah. I wonder if the active site is smaller. I don't know. We have to think about it. Because then you think about, okay, well, um, what is, what, so you have to really think about the fidelity of telomerase there. And the fidelity of DNA polymerase is maintained with the exonuclease activity, but also with the space constraints and that um, incorrectly base paired, um, incorrect bases are going to base pair so strangely that they're not going to fit well in the space, um, or they might not get in and even be able to base pair. So I wonder if there's even a smaller active site that constrains it even more. But I don't know. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> It's like the debate team. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, telomerase activity is highly conserved across um, a specific species. So if it's highly conserved, that means it's working well and you must have some type of built-in system to prevent multiple mutations to keep the species going. 
Great. Okay, so what I'm hearing from Tammy is that telomerase activity, or do you mean maybe telomere repeat sequence, is highly conserved among the species? Both. Because they have to match. Right. It's both. Um, and so it wouldn't be highly conserved if it was according to mutation. You guys are getting good. Does anyone want to add to that? Things to think about. Um, okay. Good, good guys. Yes? So, other than using the binds to the DNA were to lengthen it, uh, what, would it really matter if the telomere sequence gets mutated, like in a space where it doesn't need to be recognized? Like, because it's not really being expressed. Right. So, does it matter if it gets mutated? Well, right. So, this says, what, what's the outcome for the cell if it is mutated? Right, that brings me to the next part. So other than the fact that yes, those last few, that last bit of sequence needs to be recognized by telomerase, otherwise it will never extend it. But other than that, if it's a part that's not required for recognition by telomerase, doesn't it matter if it's mutated. You're right, does it matter? It's not a gene that's being expressed, it's just, some, it's just the end of your chromosome. And it ends up just kind of forming this loop that tucks into itself. So does it even matter? So I guess the question would be if it gets mutated, where is it mutated? Bless you. And if it's mutated in such a way that telomerase can't bind that to be a problem. And if it's if, and if it's mutated in a place that doesn't affect telomerase binding, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe. Go ahead. Okay. So the leading strand is extended by telomerase, right? That's what I told you. It's not actually doing anything to the lagging strand. So what did I say happens to the lagging strand? Does this solve the end replication problem if all we're doing is extending our leading strand? What? So not a primer, but a polymer, a DNA polymerase that is primase independent comes. Yeah. Right. Or it carries its own primase. Um, a DNA polymer, another DNA polymerase, not your replicated DNA polymerase, but I believe it's DNA polymerase alpha. I have to double double check. Comes and fills it in, and it does not require. Either that or it brings its own primates after refresh my memory. <coughs> good. Let's look at the discussion. See, this is why people are like, does it bother you if people don't come to class? I'm like, no, because what ends up happening is most of the class that does come participates in discussion, and that's more fun than having a lot of people who don't. Or at least I get, even the quiet people are doing a lot of like nodding, like, <laughs> okay, so there's this T loop that's formed with the telomeres. So this is actually showing a T loop at the end of an interphase chromosome. And so um, basically, I'll show you what it looks like here. What happens is here's your here's your it loops basically loops around here. Where am I? Where am I? It basically loops around and tucks back in. It like invades the strand, and so it creates this loop, and that creates a more stable structure. So that's your telomere. What it actually looks like. It looks like that for um, an EM electron microscopy. And then it looks like this, just in a way that's easier for you to see. And um, it's also bound by telomere binding proteins. And it helps to distinguish, um, well, basically it helps to make your telomeres not look like broken DNA. Because broken DNA is going to activate the DNA repair system, DNA damage response. Yes? Basically, what happens is this part is going to open up, and, the, and it loops, the DNA is going to loop around and tuck itself in. So 
So in your telomere ends, it just loops around and tucks in. So it's not just a plain old end. It creates this loop. And it's covered with these um, DNA binding proteins. And if you look at what they are, well, you can look it up, but most of these are DNA repair proteins. Um, you've got RAP, you've got MRE11 complex, RAD50, MBS1. These are all DNA repair proteins. Okay. So, um, in addition to DNA, right, so we just spoke all about the process of duplicating the DNA. But other components of the chromatin need to be duplicated, right? Right? What other things need to be duplicated other than just the DNA? Histones, exactly, right? All these proteins that we've been talking about that are involved in chromatin structure and function, all exam one. Did you guys forget all that stuff already? Yes. Dump. No, don't dump it, because it's all connected. Um, all those proteins need to be duplicated. All those epigenetic modifications need to be copied. All that methylation needs to be copied, right? This epigenetic inheritance. Right? So you'll have parental histone segregation. So here's your, this is what, this is exactly what your chromatin looks like, right? They're your beads on a string. And um, those parental histones, that's the light gray, are going to be redistributed between the two daughter strands. And then new nucleosomes will be added in between. And so that allows you to maintain your modifications, right? Because you're actually sharing the histone from the parental strand between the two, two new daughter strands. How does this happen? Um, so basically, what happens is the H3 and H4 tetramers are randomly distributed between the two daughter strands. And then the H2A, H2B dimers are released. So you can see here's your replication fork where this arrow is. This is your parental chromatin. And the green are your H3, H4 tetramers, and those are being distributed equally. And then your H2A and H2B dimers will eventually be added back in. And so histone chaperones are involved with this. Did we talk about histone chaperones already, or am I remembering last year? Okay. Um, so there's histone chaperones called NAF1 and CAF1, and they load H2A and H2B and H. 3H4 respectively. So NAF1 loads H2A and H2B, and CAF1 is going to load H3 and H4 um, onto the chromosome. So they actually bind, they're chaperones, so they bind to the um, subunits and load them on the DNA. Yes? It disassembles. Now, does the, does the old dimer that they go back to the old tetramer? So it could be split all up and then it's a new, this old dimer. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> right. So it's not like it's going to, it's not, so the question is, is the old dimer and the old tetramer going to come back together on the new DNA? No, not necessarily. What's important, though, is that you're getting this even distribution and then sprinkling in the new stuff, and then you're going to have your reader-writer complexes that are going to spread your modifications. Because all your histones have the modifications already that they had, right? And then they're going to go from in front of the repl replication fork to right behind the replication fork and be added. And so you'll be able to keep those modifications. 
So it doesn't really matter for these two guys. So H3 and H4 tetramers are actively transferred by these histone chaperones. And so notice there's a, there's a new one. So there's NAP1 and CAF1, and then there's also um, ASF1. So um, the H3 and H4 tetramers are actively transferred by both CAF1 and ASF1 from parental DNA to daughter DNA molecule. And so it's showing right here, they contain these acetylation and, wait a minute. Yep, so they maintain their modifications, but then new histones, they, they have different modifications and they're acetylated at a certain location and they're recognized and then they are added, and then the and then the new that acetylation is removed, and the appropriate modifications are added. So it's a way for recognizing the new histone is this specific acetylation marker. Maybe I have another slide that explains that better. Yep, there. Okay. Yep. So um, later, NAP1 comes and adds in H2A and H2B reconstitute the nucleosomes. So you've got your new histones assembling right next to your parental histones, and those parental histones maintain their modification and will recruit enzymes that will spread those modifications to the new histones. And so those new histones are, rec they're called s phase histones, they're recognized by specific lysine acetylation. <coughs> so CAF1 and ASF1, they're going to recognize these new histones because they're going to bind specifically to histones with this acetylated lysine. And it's a specific acetylated lysine. And um, CAF1 interacts with the sliding clamp. Yep. Uh, so basically all you're doing is you've got stuff on your parental, just to make it really simple, right? You've got all your parental histones, and then they're going to get redistributed to the daughter strand. And the H3, H4 tetramers are going to go directly, and the <coughs> H2A, H2B, those are going to kind of disassemble and then be added back in later. And then you're going to, since you're having half of your histones go to one daughter strand, half to another, you're going to have new histones show up too. But those will be modified, and so that's how they're recognized as new histones by certain histone chaperones. Okay? Um, right, so CAF1 is going to bind to the new tetramers and interact with the sliding clamp. And that's how it helps to target these histones to the DNA directly behind the replication form. Because remember, you want transfer from parent to daughter at around the same location, right? You don't want, oops, a few thousand kill bases go by and we didn't put histone back. Let's put it in another place and suddenly we have the wrong modifications in the wrong places. So CAF1 and ASF1 are going to assemble the tetramer, the H3 and H4 tetramer, into a nucleosome. And then those new histones are going to be deacetylated because, remember, the acetylation they had was the new histone acetylation. And then after they're deposited on the DNA, they're going to be deacetylated, and then they're going to gain the chromatin marks that, are up, that the neighboring histones have. Right, and so this is, yep. So that's, that's the solution, it's just adding it in the cell. Mm -hmm. So, are there different types of the solution? Yep, so remember, um, so the question is, wait a minute, the acetylation is just adding the seal group to a lysine, right? Mm -hmm. Are there different types of acetylation? Yes, because remember, on a histone tail, 
you have many different lysines. And depending on which lysine is acetylated, it's going to mean something different. Remember the whole histone code? Mm -hmm. Remember um, that paper where they did that chromatin IP of all the different modified histones? Mm -hmm. We're looking at acetylation of lysine 9, acetylation of lysine 10, acetylation of lysine whatever. So depending on where on your tail you're acetylated, it's going to be diff mean a different thing. And so there's one kind of acetylation that's like a new histone acetylation. And that is recognized by histone chaperones to bring it to the, to the new DNA, to associate with the slightly clamp, add it to the new DNA after replication. And then that acetylation will be removed because then you don't need it anymore. And then the, the different chromatin marks that are on the surrounding nucleosomes that came from the parent will be spread to that new one. <coughs> and so that's what's going on here, right? So the parental nucleosomes have their own modifications, right? And so only half are going to go to each, um, each of the daughter strands of DNA. And so you need to spread those modifications. And that where you get, that's where these more, more reader-writer complexes, you thought you were done, more reader-writer complexes are going to come in, they're going to read the mark on the parent nucleosome and spread it to the new nucleosomes. Who is that? You were raising your hand? So the modification on the parent is going to be the same as in the mother? Yeah. Because you want, it's that epigenetic inheritance. Modification is going to be inherited. Just like your DNA sequence is inherited, the modifications of your nucleosomes are inherited, and that makes sense, right? Because certain regions of your chromatin are silenced. And you, you shouldn't have to like reinvent the wheel each time you replicate your DNA, right? So things that were silenced will remain silent. Things that were more active will remain more active, or whatever. Okay, I think it's really the methylation that's a big one. I guess it all is. Any other questions? Yeah. How, how is it spread? So your reader-writer complexes. So here's one. This is kind of just like a reader-writer complex, but it's going to bind to the modification that's on a, on a uh, nucleosome of parental origin, and then it's going to and then it's going to copy it to the neighboring nucleosome. Reader reads what was on the parent mm -hmm. and writes on the new. So that way everything ends up with the same modification. I'm sorry, I was just I was just confused because before when we talked about reader writer, there was something that was being read. So if it's if it's a new Remember, then there's nothing there to read to So here, write. this is your parental, this guy right here is your parental DNA. And after replication, remember, your histones are going in two directions, right? So all the stuff coming from your parental DNA is written on, right? It has the acetylations or methylations or whatever modifications. That's what's being read, right? And so then it's just kind of copying it onto the neighboring. Any other questions? I believe, oh, that is it for today. You guys have to go a few minutes early.